what I might do, if you don't mind, Jill, I'll just make a start. Um, my PowerPoint's not that significant that you have to see it, so <laughs> I'll just start the conversation anyway. Um, so, um, hi everybody, I'm Annika Ferguson. I'm actually with the ANU College of Law. Um, you might have seen that my presentation relates to blockchain. So to any of the um, computer scientists, engineers in the room who want to pull apart my interpretation of it, please do so. Um, before starting the presentation, I just wish to acknowledge that a lot of the ideas for this presentation actually came about out of a blockchain um, business strategy exercise that I completed as part of my study um, in a blockchain strategy short course at RMIT. Um, and without that course, I wouldn't have considered this as a concept at all. The disclaimer is that all the errors in the presentation are mine. Um, so, as I said, even though I've been an educated researcher, primarily online for 10 years, my focus on blockchain is relatively new, and therefore I'm indebted to anyone who identifies the errors and misconceptions in my thinking and puts me right. <laughs> yes, it is. It's... One here. Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Basically, um, in my view, and it is largely, oh, it's not just my view, but tertiary education in general is at a crossroads. Um, and there are other scholars who are far more read out on this issue than I am. Um, within my field, it's people like Professor Paul Mahag and um, the futurist Richard Susskind are particularly prominent about um, the changes that need to be made in the legal education sphere. Um, but sort of just to put it simply in the terms as I see it from my point of view, Internet 1.0 has provided an alternative way of us accessing quality information from experts and researchers than just through university. And this information is available just in time for any particular environment. So the value proposition for why students might want to attend university has fundamentally changed. Um, so I appreciate that that's a controversial suggestion in some quarters, but if we're just to put our students' hat on, hats on for a moment, and, current, and consider our current interactions with the tertiary education system. And I must have put my hand up at this point and say I'm a perpetual student as much as a lecturer. Um, I'm always studying other things. It's a good way to learn how, well, maybe to be a better teacher, maybe. Um, anyway, but um, so I'll just sort of paint a picture of a, an amalgam of experiences as a student myself, but also as I observe my students and how they're engaging with this environment. So they enrol in a course, they hand over their money, or they get their fee help sorted. However, despite the various committees and the student organisations that are you know, invited into various meetings on educational design and things, they really have no direct control over what their money is spent on. But, so for example, if they do get a bad tutor, whatever that relates to, They've got no way of immediately withdrawing their money and going finding something better. You're sometimes, and as a student, you're sometimes told that education is a constructive, collaborative process. I think that's a lot of what we aim for when we're teaching. And this might be evidenced through Q&A forums or participation marks on tutorials so that you're encouraged to express your views. However, these are sometimes dominated with those strong personalities, probably me, who may or may not behave in a professional fashion and all the interactions in the forums or in tutorials are superficial at best. They don't actually encourage the in-depth creative thinking, analysis, research or responses to world problems that we want. And I, I, I know that as lecturers we want that depth of engagement to occur too. Finally, as a student you might want to be that engaged student, but you notice that the only way you are rewarded for your engagement is through assessments. In fact, those assessments might not reward the behaviours that are relevant beyond academia. Or those assessments might still reward the people who are good at studying at or completing exams, but haven't otherwise engaged in anything else going on in the course. And when you do receive feedback, 
there was no way of actually providing genuine feedback on whether it has been useful to your learning or to demonstrate that it's meant something to you beyond a belated self-review, which doesn't improve the situation immediately for you. I'm saying this, this is a, almost an archetype, stereotypical approach. It's not going to be applicable all the time, but this is one perspective on how students still are engaging with their tertiary education. So in essence, you have little control over what happens in this environment. In many senses, education is still something that is done to you rather than something that you're generally and genuinely involved in. When you complete a course, you receive a grade, and sometimes a numerical number to give to potential employers as evidence of your knowledge and skill. But how potential employers interpret these grades are purely arbitrary. And when employers keep saying, we hear it in various different, different disciplines, happens in law, keep saying that university graduates aren't ready for the real world. So, as I said, there's an element of hyperbole in this description. Um, I suspect that as lecturers you may see some truths in that, but do we not lament the lack of attendance or the lack of shallow student engagement, obsession with obsess um, assessment and grades to the detriment of actually in-depth creative thinking, um, that there is no, um, or that there is no immediate reward necessarily acknowledged by employees of our graduates that our compulsory courses, which are often named universally the same thing across multiple universities, are actually producing higher quality work than elsewhere. So what the employer sees on a transcript is a course named X and a grade. Does that grade genuinely reflect the same kind of level of attainment and knowledge that it does from another university? And finally, don't we all lament the administrative tasks of putting students into seminars and tracking their engagement or even of actually doing anything remotely outside sort of set boxes? It becomes with an administrative burden. So I put all that out there with the idea of exploring the idea that there is potential to utilise some of the blockchain technology to improve this interaction and to improve the value proposition of higher education. Um, just sort of a quick um, hands up around the room. Am I talking to people who understand what blockchain is? Okay, cool. Okay, I'm more than happy to give a quick interaction. Um, when I, I had to do this exercise, you'll appreciate this, the Lego builder in the room, had to do this exercise at um, the start of my RMIT course um, and explain it to a five-year-old, to then understand it at a five-year-old level, and I did use my son's Lego to try and explain it, but um, I won't do that today. <laughs> Just a quick overview of blockchain itself. Um, I'm not going to go into a history lesson of where it started, um, but instead sort of focus on the functionality possibilities from it. So essentially, blockchain is a distributed ledger system. It's a ledger of things. It utilises nodes of computers and advanced mathematical algorithms that I don't even bother trying to get my head around to secure data in blocks on a chain chronologically so that the information can be communicated peer to peer. There is no middleman, such as banks for currency or administrators to check that a service has been accessed and given. It is secure, although not as necessarily secure as some of the hyperbole around blockchain suggests. Um, they like to put it out there as something that is completely more secure than anything else out there, but there are problems with that. It's very transparent. It's decentralised. So one of the things that does make it more secure is that instead of it being centralised in a centralised database on one computer in one institution, the um, information is distributed across the nodes, which are all held by various different computers and phones and everything else like this, um, and decentralised so that you have to take down the whole system, the whole decentralised system, in under 10 minutes in order to take it down. So you'd have to get into every one of those nodes and take them all down in a 10 minute period in order to take it down. Um, or less, depending on sort of the refresh rate on the blockchain. Um, it does not, this is a really interesting function of it, it does not need the people and the transactions to trust each other in order to finalise transactions. So, in a lot of our transactions that we do in the world, currency transactions, for example, if we're paying from one bank account to another, we rely on the bank 
as our trust mechanism, which is slightly hilarious given recent, um, <laughs> recent things. We rely on the bank as the trusted intermediary. Blockchain takes out the need for that bank, that institution to be in the middle because it is what's in the middle and it's a decentralised process that doesn't constitute control or power in a single being or institution. Any changes to the blockchain are verified and retained ostensibly forever, which could be a problem, by a decentralised process. So you can look at a blockchain and see exactly where changes were made and by whom although you might not be able to identify the actual person, and no one person or institution controls the audit trail. So there is no single point of failure or no single point of control. Although there are both public and private blockchains, the public ones need not reveal the identity of the people, only the information relating to the transactions they have carried out. And it is impossible, it is possible, not impossible, to build incentives into a blockchain system to encourage the kinds of behaviours you want to see without administrative Heinz oversight. So, as I said, one of the uh, attractive features of blockchain is it cuts out middlemen and the administrators by enabling peer-to-peer -peer transactions to occur. I am getting to how this applies for education shortly, <laughs> okay? So, although it was originally utilised for cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, you will have heard of, there are many more out there. And it was most notably enabled the dark web for such lovely nefarious purposes as Silk Road. Some com commentators, which has subsequently supposedly been shut down, some commentators say it is a solution that still has to find a problem. Okay, so we're still, it's still a potential, I think, blockchain technology. It hasn't, it's been realized in some areas. So having said that, blockchain is being utilized in the healthcare sector to improve record keeping in some areas. Uh, big blockchains like Ethereum provide a blockchain support for smart contracts that are used as the basis for significant application development. Blockchains like NEM are providing the basis for developments such as recording artistic copyright, supply chain management and accounting. And it's also been used for many other purposes such as recording land titles. Sweden has done this. There is a very fine example of why it didn't work in um, Guam. Ride care share programs in California. Um, there's the distribution of humanitarian aid which is being facilitated through this blockchain technology. So the World Food Programs um, Building Blocks pilot provided food to, I love how it's a pilot, provided food to 10,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan. But also it's being utilized by seven other UN ag agencies in other ways. Um, another blockchain, and this is probably most relevant to what I'm going to talk about here, Steam, it, um, utilises the blockchain token systems of Steams to encourage meaningful contributions on a social media platform. So it's similar to Reddit, but with the ability to reward and encourage good behaviours, behavior, including good contributions and collations, and discouraging bad behaviours through the loss of eSteam and Steam points. So, and universities are already running pilots utilising blockchain as a way of storing and transmitting graduate qualifications. Beyond this though in education, I think we should all pay a lot of attention to this because this Wolf University is an Oxford University collaboration which has significant money behind it and has significant personnel attached to it. And they've released a white paper which is well worth reading for a blockchain university that cements, cements the Oxbridge model of learning, that one-on-one -on -one tutoring in a blockchain environment. More specifically, their system utilises WOLF tokens that students get as part of the payment for their courses in order to set up tutorial sessions and for the tutors to be quickly and easily paid through the tokens, which can be transmitted into real money as well for students' attendance. And there's the appropriate penalties for non-attendance attached to that as well. This all happens and can happen without the intervention of a third party administrator by util utilising blockchain technology. Um, I, reading the Wolf University white paper, it's a really admirable undertaking and highlights that whether or not we like it, blockchain is coming in as a very creditable player in higher education. Um, it's really, if you look at the people that are behind this, it's not just that it's out of Oxford, it's also attached to some of the biggest, you know, we've got researchers from some of the biggest universities in the world, credible attached to all of this. Um, and so I think it requires us to consider 
how we might play in the sphere. Um, so the Wolf University white paper highlights the direction, um, but really does focus on cementing that Oxbridge model of learning, but online in the blockchain thing. Um, and so I think in that essence, it provides us an opportunity because it misses out on some of the opportunities for adopting more collaborative approaches to learning available to peers that could also be completed by using blockchain. So this goes back to um, my previous proposition, I sort of came around in a circle, that there is a potential to utilise several features of blockchain to meet some of the challenges being faced by tertiary education. So in essence, I can see the potential for blockchain to improve education by rewarding students for engaging meaningfully and professionally in their education, providing students with mechanisms for taking control of the value of their education, and creating an incentivised learning environment that develops and encourages professional behaviour and feedback between students and between students and mentors. <coughs> creating a learning environment where students can choose, attend and pay for the mentors slash tutors they need to meet their needs without substantial administrative overheads. Similarly, it allows mentors tutors to make their times available so it becomes a two-way process, which is actually one of the drivers of time behind Wolf University is that people, highly qualified people, are finding it hard to get stable jobs. And so Wolf University provides an option for those people who are highly qualified to um, uh, put out their services to um, students. Providing a secure, verified and immutable way in which students can provide evidence of their abilities, the proof of value beyond the certification that we currently provide at the end. So to do this, um, I'm envisioning a sort of an entirely token-based education system that revolutionises the experience for students and staff to create genuinely creative professional learning communities. Now just because it involves blockchain technology, which is an online technology, doesn't mean that it's not applicable and can't be used <coughs> for on-campus either. So I sort of see using three aspects of blockchain as a way, and there's probably a whole lot of other ways you could do it as well, of creating this environment. But firstly, you could utilise something like the Steemit style Q&A forums to promote meaningful engagement and development of professional reputation, exchange of ideas, collation of research by and for students. So if you, what the token-based system would allow you to literally provide tokens as voted for by a large group, so you're not down to things. If students engage with their education in a more meaningful way, they will receive redeemable, redeemable within, a, within the educational context, tokens for positive, creative and professional engagement. And thus they could be sort of getting their, some of their money that they've spent on their education when they enrol and pay their money back through a token system that they then can put into the system and also have put out of it. Potentially, you can almost reward them for engagement by making their education cheaper if, you know, if, they're, re if they're redeeming tokens. So the forums could also be taken up to encourage and re reward professional character, um, sort of set up to reward professional characteristics in an immediate fashion. So, for example, if someone puts up a post that is badly written, has a bad tone, otherwise extremely offensive, they can get that feedback straight away, maybe, and it doesn't have to be personal in the sense that it's somebody saying you've given bad feedback, it comes down to the rating system that they can appreciate then that what they have said might not be being received in the way they wanted it to be received. Um, as I mentioned, they can utilise their tokens to book in, attend and pay for sessions with mentors, tutors on specific sessions. Um, so this allows students to utilise their tokens to check in to these sessions, and that in a sense, I would suggest, allows them to have a bit more skin in the game um, because they actually have to physically hand over their tokens and or lose them if they don't turn up um, in order to attend. Um, there'd also be a possibility of rewarding appropriate behaviours between mentors, tutors, students in a 360 sense. So re mentors receiving additional tokens based on esteem ratings from numbers of students. Students receiving esteem ratings for providing appropriate feedback and participation. Um, and finally, the blockchain technology could be utilised to create an immutable and verifiable proof of value of an education in the form of a sort of portfolio, which we already do have, 
but of appropriately selected and verified work the students can then provide to potential employers, but it's actually verified. So it's beyond just being a portfolio in your hand, you actually have a way of verifying it. So this it creates an increase of transparency of what students are learning and possibly increased meaningful participation and dialogue between employers and academia in the way in which the education is being provided. I understand I've run out of time probably, have I? Yeah, okay. So um, there is a bit more to it, but I just wanted to say, so in adopting any new technology, the hurdles of consumer buy-in and technical know-how capability will always rear their heads. Um, I'm certainly uh, not... You know, the bit I've cut out is all of the hurdles to adopting this kind of blockchain technology and how you do it. But I'm just wondering that given the seeming inevitability of blockchain or Internet 2.0 to shake things up again, whether it's worth trying to get on the front foot and engage with it in a way that brings some of the value back to education that we may have lost through Internet 1.0. So thank you very much. I think there's el there's those elements, each of those elements that I've discussed, the, the separate bits, could be applied. You don't have to set up a whole university. Um, and I probably would discourage anybody from doing that from scratch anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there are elements. Um, I know, like I know that in your online courses you have the Q&A where p students rate each other. I'm wondering whether this is a way to just make that even more of an in intense, engaging process by utilising a token system. Um, one of the things that I particularly attracted me to it is this issue of professional reputation and um, the fact we have ways that we try to encourage prof professional behaviour um, amongst students. Um, I think some of it lacks that immediate feedback on what their actions and things and how they are being heard by others. And I do think that probably through a system like this, you have to have the appropriate criteria set up behind it. Um, the big one I would say was you'd have to be very careful that you didn't end up with witch hunts. And it's something that Steemit is even very aware of, and they've got tens of thousands of users on there. But um, that you know, there's still the possibility for witch hunts to occur. But ways to ameliorate that would be to create the criteria against people of being evaluated in such a way and rewarded to try and encourage the behaviour. So my response to that was actually, um, I also have some psychological qualifications. Um, I'm certainly not fully there. We'd be, if you were to set up something like that, it would have to be a collaboration between educators, psychologists in organisational behaviour, and obviously the people putting together the blockchain token system who have the qualifications, which is another big problem. Finding developers with the ability to do this work um, is difficult. I think if you attach yourself to an existing blockchain, it would reduce some of that, but you still have to have knowledge of programming that I don't have. So, yeah, there's a long answer to your simple question. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Thank you.